Okay, uh, welcome <laughs> everyone. Uh, today I will uh, present microvibration of thyroid nodules. And uh, this is my hospital. Uh, I'm working at the Department of Interventional Radiology at Antalya Research Hospital. My hospital uh, is the biggest hospital in the Mediterranean region in Turkey, and it has uh, 1,506 beds, and uh, we have 1,180 doctors. Uh, since 2015, uh, we begin as my, uh, with my department to thyroid thermal ablations, and my thyroid thermal ablation case number is 3,200 cases. Uh, we published eight uh, research papers in the literature, and I organized uh, 15 workshops in my department for thyroid ablation. And in this workshop, uh, train uh, 40 national and 28 international doctors. And here are some pictures uh, of the workshop uh, from my hospital. And here are some webinars before uh, I attend. And we have here, uh, this is my published uh, research papers. Uh, one of them is in clinical endocrinology. And in this paper, we, uh, name of this paper is Microablation of Symptomatic Benign Thyroid Nodules Short and Long-Term Effects of Thyroid Function Test and Thyroglobin and Thyroid Antibodies. And what we found in this uh, research paper is uh, the first, uh, 24 hours is very important uh, for the follow-up. And in the second uh, is the microablation of benign thyroid nodules effects on systemic uh, inflammatory response. And we don't found any changes. And here is another uh, paper, microablation of autonomous functional thyroid nodules, a comparative study with radioactive iodine therapy on the functional treatment section. And the uh, results was uh, they are both effective, but after uh, radioactive iodine therapy, uh, in 30% of the patients occur hypothyroidism. But in microablation, we don't see this. And this is another paper from me. And in this paper, uh, we researched the microablation as an efficient therapy for primary hyperthyroidism efficacy and predictors for treatment success. And the treatment success in uh, primary hyperparatism is 92% very high and very effective. And what is microwave physics? Uh, by creating an electromagnetic field around the percutons antennae and rotating the water molecules in the tissue around their axis, three, four billion times per second, kinetic energy and heat consists. And high frequency electromagnetic energy passes unimpeded into the tissue and induces hyperthermia by rapid oscillation of water molecules. This direct tissue heating is less susceptible to the purpose and cooling of blood supply, thereby allowing larger volume and more consistent tissue necros. And what is the goal in thyroid thermoblation? The main goal is to elevate tissue temperatures enough to create zones of irreversible cellular damage. And thermal ablation heats tissue to cytotex level through with cell date is caused. Afterwards, the created coagulative necrosis is degraded by the patient's own immune system. The main goal is the heat between 80 and 100 Celsius. Uh, and if uh, between 80 and 100 Celsius heat occur, then occurred cytotoxic effects, cell death, coagulative necrosis, and destroyed and fucked by the immune system macrophages. But if the heat is above 100 Celsius, then we have a problem. Then occur at the tissue carbonization, and it can't fucked it by the macrophage. Therefore, it is very important that the thermal ablation heat is between 80 and 100 Celsius. And what we use in microwave, in my clinic, we use ECHO. And the microwave unit consists of a microwave generator flexible low low quark cell coupled internal cooled shaft antenna. The generator is capable of producing between one and 200 watt of power at 2,450 megas in the form of pulse or continuous. But normally 
in liver ablation, we use 50 and 60 watt. But in microablation, we must use low power outputs between 20 and 30 watts to recommend it to minimize tissue sharing and in thyroid ablation. This is a very important point. And uh, for thyroid ablation, uh, there we have a special uh, antenna. It is uh, 16 or 70 gauge. The shaft is 10 centimeters, but the very small, 3.5 active tip, and the shaft is coated with polytetrafluoroethylene to prevent tissue adhesion. Now, as we know, we have uh, radiofrequency ablation and microwave ablation. We use them both in thermal ablation. And what is the advantage of radiofrequency ablation compared to microwave ablation? Firstly, the antenna used for radiofrequency ablation is thinner than microwave. Most of them is 18 or 19 gauge. Uh, in microwave uh, is the tennis antenna 17 gauge. Radiofrequency ablation works according to the tissue impedance. And as we know, tissue carbonization causes about 800 ohm. And it, if it goes up to maximum of 800 ohms, the radiofrequency ablation they will automatically stop. And this is a protective negative effect on carbonization. This is the advantage of radiofrequency ablation. And as we know, we have more experience since 2011 in thyroid ablation with radiofrequency ablation. Uh, what is the advantage of microwave ablation? The first is larger ablated tissue volumes in the same times. It is very uh, important. I will give now an uh, example. Uh, mostly of the patients that we treat with thermal ablation are big nodules, 20 cc, 30 cc. If we treated a 30 cc uh, nodule with ratifacance ablation, the thermal ablation time is between 20 and 30 uh, minutes. But if we treated with microwave the same uh, volume, only in 10 minutes it is finished. And in microwave ablation, we have no heat sink effect. It is very effect, uh, in, uh, in, important because uh, if uh, occur heat sink effect, then we have an ineffective ablation. And tissue impedance doesn't matter. Therefore, we have optimal heating in cystic in hemorrhagic nodules, in hypervascular nodules, in toxic adenoma. And microablation does not require the placement of grounding pads. Therefore, we can use microablation in pregnancy, in pacemakers, heart pace, in joint prosthesis, in teeth implants. In this patient group, we cannot use radiofrequency ablation. And while we don't uh, use grunting pads. We have no ionic current passing through the body, as in RFA. Therefore, most of the patients have less pain during the procedure. Select the right patients, guidelines, FNE, and nodal features. In thermal, thyroid thermal guidelines, we have two main guidelines. The first is the Korean guidelines. It is, I think, the most important guidelines. And the second is the European guidelines. And uh, the, in Korean and in the Italian guidelines, they previously validated thermal ablation as the first line treatment for benign thyroid nodules. In uh, European Thyroid Association guidelines, recommended thermal ablation in adult patients with benign thyroid nodules as an alternative option to surgical treatment. And what is the Korean guideline? In Korean guideline, the indication is patients with benign thyroid nodules producing symptoms or cosmetic concerts, uh, autonomous uh, function thyroid nodules, either toxic or pretoxic. Potential indications are primary thyroid cancers, PTMC, or recurrent thyroid cancer in thyroidectomy bed and in cervical lymph nodes in patients at high cervical risk or who refuse surgery. Uh, contraindications is are follicular neoplasm or malignancy. And relative contraindications, this is for RFA, but not for mi uh, microwave, pregnant women, several heart disease or pacemakers, or existing vocal cord palsy on the contralateral side. And uh, here are uh, the guideline, new guideline last year. This is uh, this guideline established both, both, uh, both from European Thyroid Association and from the European Cardiovascular Intervention Society. 
And this guideline, clinic practice guideline, is for the use of minimal invasive treatments in malignant thyroid uh, lesions. And in this guideline, uh, there uh, is indications for image, image guide thermal ablations in thyroid malignancy should be evaluated by multidisciplinary. It is very important by endocrinologists, by interventional radiologists, and by general surgeon, including experts in both traditional and image guided intervention treatments. In incidentally, discovered low risk popular thyroid microcarcinoma in patients who are not eligible for a decline surgery. Thermal ablation may be considered as an alternative option. This is the last guideline from Europe. And the use of the thermal ablations may be considered in patients with diffuse thyroid carcinoma in the following conditions. If it's papillary thyroid microcarcinoma, if it's an unresectable thyroid cancer, or is a neck lymph node recurrence of diffuse thyroid carcinomas, or if you have distant metastases. In these conditions, we can use thyroid thermal ablation, microwave ablations. And the second is thermal ablations in different uh, 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 carcinomas. Here are important things, the cytology. Uh, suspicion of aggressive subtypes of thyroid carcinoma, tall cell, insulin, and cell. In this group, we don't do thermal ablation. And before the ablation, we might uh, at the imaging detection. If uh, the patient has extra thyroid growth, multiple neoblastic focus, presence of lymph node or distant metastases, in this group, we don't do thermal ablation. Or if the patient has worrisome molecular patterns, third promoter or TP53 uh, mutations, in this group, we don't do thermal ablations. And here, uh, are uh, fa uh, factors favoring thermal ablations. Uh, in young patients, no comorbidity in, in familiar form, it is better that we do surgery in malignant disease. But if the patient have old age, uh, problem with general anesthesia, uh, if the patient have contralateral vocal cord palsy, refuse the surgery in these patients, we can do thermal ablation. Or if the patient have in the cytology popular carcinoma classical one, uh, it is better in thermal ablation, but if the patient have worrisome cytology, photos or high risk molecular pattern, it is better for surgery. And in the ultrasound examination before ablation, uh, it's better that the uh, lesion is in the central location, well-definite margins, absence of capsular contact is very important. Solitary thyroid lesion, no evidence of extra thyroid spread. If we have this criteria, we can do thermal ablations. Indications. Uh, indications is firstly, cystic nodules that contains 20% more solid components. Because if you treat this group with alcohol ablation, the recurrent rates are between 26 and 38 in this patient group. Second is solid and mixed tip uh, nodules under 30 cc because about 30 cc mostly of the patients need the second season uh, treatment and therefore we must uh, this uh, explain to the patients the other group is autonomous toxic nodules is very effective in this group thyroid nodule plus previous thyroid surgery this is the biggest group uh, that uh, sent by general surgeons because it, this group is very complicated in the second surgery and uh, mostly of the general surgery sent this group uh, to thermal ablation. Parathyroid adenomas, papillar thyroid microcarcinomas, and patients at risk of general anesthesia. And here are some nodule features that increase volume reduction rate. This nodule step below are the best candidates for thyroid ablation. In this group are the result very good. Firstly, of them is spongiform ecostructures, nodules with liquid component, intense peripheral and intranodal pattern vascularity, soft nodules, shear wave elastography below 30 kilopascal, soft nodules. These are very good candidates and nodules volume below 10 cc. Uh, some uh, factors uh, 
uh, that affect the volume reduction rate. First claim of operator skills and experience. Uh, second is we must use low watts in microwave between 20 and 30 watts. And if we use, then avoid carbonization and we have higher volume reduction rate. And the ablation of the peripheral margins of the thyroid nodule is very important because the peripheral margins are the entry points of the artery and the vessels. If we don't ablate this peripheral margins, mostly the regular point is this uh, parts. But most of the operators have some anxiety about uh, uh, ablation of these margins because uh, they will avoid from thermal injury. Therefore, therefore we must use hydrodissection uh, to better ablation of nodule margin. And if we use hydrodissection, then uh, protection from complications by preventing thermal damage to structures such as laryngeal nerve and nervous vagus adjacent to the nodule. And uh, the hormone profile is very important. Patients must be have normal, uh, uh, the hormones must be normal limits, uh, atrioid. They are suitable for ablation, but in some hypervascular nodules, 5% in toxic adenomas may present as atrioid. In this patient with toxic adenoma, the contralateral lateral thyroid lobe is atrophic. If we see this in ultrasound, we must request a thyroid scintigraphy here. And another important point is in hypervascular solid nodules, thyroglobulin and T, uh, T3 and T4 levels may increase significantly due to the destruction of the follicular cells in the ablation nodule and sometimes occur thyrotoxicosis. Therefore, uh, patient preparation is very important. And the first uh, one week uh, follow up is very important in this patient group. Another patient group is with uh, high thyroid anti uh, antibodies before the procedure. If uh, we do in this group thermal ablation, after ablation release of antigenic matter such as TCH releasing from follicular thyroid cells, and they trigger anti autoimmune inflammatory processes like autoimmune hypertrophic microbes. It is very rare, but normally. Uh, I do uh, in Hashimoto thyroiditis uh, uh, thermal ablation if the patient have a nodule. But if the patient's uh, auto, -anti uh, auto anticourse is in a very high level, I don't do. And my experience is if we do in uh, thyroiditis uh, so ablation, nice. patients have, uh, are very sensitive to uh, pain. The second important thing is volume reduction rate. Uh, normally, in the uh, classical volume reduction rate goes uh, above fifty percent, but I think in clinical practice it must be minimum seventy percent. And as a rule, volume reduction rate is higher in cystic nodules than solid nodules, and the volume reduction rate increases as the elastography value degrades. And uh, we have a continuing clinical. Uh, trial in your uh, clinic uh, and what we found is this nodules with a share wave elastic and nodules with a share wave elastic volume above 60 kilopascal with micro calcification have volume reduction rate below 50 percent therefore it is very important Always we uh, measure uh, the nodules elastography before the ablation. And if the nodules volume is above 60 kilopascal, and if the nodule have uh, macro calcification, it is not a good candidate for thermal ablation. We refuse this patient group because the volume reduction rate is below 50%. And uh, thyroid ablation should be monitored by uh, volume. Uh, sorry, by volume. Here's the example. We must think 3D. Normally, uh, in the clinical practice, we don't write volume. We only write the two diameter or the three diameter of the nodule. But here's an uh, example. Before, uh, the ablation nodule is three, three, three centimeter, and the volume is 14 cc. Uh, after ablation, we have only one centimeter difference, but the volume reduction rate is 
33%. It is very important. Therefore, we do every time uh, monitor, monitor it, follow up with the CC. And uh, before ablation, we need always a fine needle biopsy and the last mount. And always we uh, speak with the patient and we ask him or her symptom score, cosmetic score. We take a, a laboratory test, complete blood count, uh, thyroid function test. And this is uh, the uh, follow-up form from my clinic. Uh, this is not only for patients, both to the clinicians. Because this is a new technique and I explain here. Firstly, I draw the nodule place here and I write here nodule features. We write here the nodule volume, the nodule structure, the nodule vascularity, the elastography value of the nodule, the cosmetic score, symptom score, and which what we use and the processing time. The follow-ups are uh, the first one more than three, six, and 12 months. And we write here the same things. The difference is we write here uh, extra the volume reduction rate. And uh, it's very effective, this follow-up form. Risk assessment in thyroid ablation, anatomy, and how to avoid complications. Yes. Firstly, uh, we work in a very narrow area. We have many anatomic structures close to the thyroid module. Uh, the most important is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. It is normally uh, between the trachea and the thyroid top in the danger triangle. Sometimes second is the middle cervical sympathetic ganglion. Normally uh, it is uh, in the posterior side, but sometimes it is have anatomical variations. It's in the middle side of the color. Second, as far. In every ablation, before the preparation, I look uh, with ultrasound to the nervous vagus. It is very important. Most of the with nervous vagus are terminal complications. Normally, the nervous vagus is on the three uh, percent of the patients uh, is in this is type one, and in the type two, it is on the uh, twelve clock. But in some patients, it is on 10 o'clock and at 6 o'clock. In this patient group, it is close to the thyroid nodule. And if we ablate the thyroid nodule, then it can be occur here in this case is thermal ablation. Therefore, the first step is to evaluate the position of the nervous vagus. And the second step is to evaluate the position of the middle sympathetic ganglion. Normally, the middle sympathetic ganglion is lateral of the carotid artery. But in some cases, like here, it is middle, in the, it is in the medial side of the carotid artery, close to the uh, thyroid nodule. And in these cases, if we uh, do thermal, uh, thermal injury to the uh, middle sympathetic ganglion, then occur Horner syndrome. And another important thing is, this is the biggest group that the general surgeons sent to us. It's the patients with the history of total subtotal thyroidectomy. Uh, in this patient group, we must do hydrogen section uh, to be performed in patients who will go under ablation because in this group, the course of the recurrent laryngeal nerve changed completely in this patient group. This is very important. And this is one of my uh, complications. And here we have a, a damage to the cervical sympathetic change. And, and we see here uh, meiosis, pitosis, and anhydrosis. This is hormone syndrome. And here I have another complication. This is uh, thermal injury in the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. And here we see, uh, with, I look uh, to every patient before ablation and after ablation with ultrasound. Before, in the first case, I sent every patient to NNT species, but then I tried to look with ultrasound, it is very effective. And here we see the right vocal cord paralysis here and left vocal cord is uh, movement. And in the another clip, we see here the normal vocal cord movements. Both. It is very easy, and I prefer 
before every ablations uh, to look to the vocal cords with the ultrasound. Why? In some complicated, in some uh, patients ha have unilateral uh, vocal cord palsy, but the voice is normal because it's a compensatory effect. And if you make a thermal injury in the another side, we have a big complication. Therefore, please look with the ultrasound to the vocal cords before. It is very easy. And after the ablations, if you finish the ablation, look again that you have any complication, thermal injuries. Sometimes we have some voice changes uh, during the procedure or immediately after ablation. Uh, some of them is recurrent laryngeal nerve thermal injury. Some of them is lidocaine effect that we use, or some of them is stretching of the nerve over a hematome or of the hydrosection fluid that we give post hemorrhage inflammation or fibrosis around the neck. And uh, we do the ablation and the uh, patients have problem and we see that the patient, or we heard that the patient have voice changes, okay? We look to the vocal cords and we see a vocal cord palsy or moving, less moving. And this is a treatment. This is a paper from uh, Korea from uh, Mr. Baik. Uh, we have always, 10 or 20 cc called dextrose, very cold. And I mixture them with methylprednisolone. And if the patient have voice changes, I go to the danger, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve course to the uh, danger triangle and I give 20 cc. By the cold effect and with anti-inflammatory effect for methylprednisolone, most of them result in five and 10 minutes. It is a very good uh, solution uh, for treatment of thermal injury complications. And before the ablation, it is important uh, that we make a risk assessment. This is a paper from China, from Dr. Shaoying, and he make a classification of the uh, risk. And what he say is, in summary, uh, between the nodule and the anatomic uh, structure must be minimum two millimeters distance. If we have not two millimeter, dif uh, millimeter distance, we must use hydrosection to avoid thermal injuries. And what can we use for hydrosection? Normally, we use crystalloid liquids. Mostly, I use uh, dextrose, sometimes saline. As we know, we cannot use saline as, uh, for hydrosection in radiofrequency ablation due to, to ionization. But the problem in crystalloid liquids is, if we give for hydrosection, the fluid absorption is very fast. And the continuity of the safe hydrosection distance is very short. And then uh, we develop a new solution in my clinic. This is a new clinical trial. We, we write this research paper. We use Volivan. It is an iso-oncolic liquid. Normally, we use Volivan in the emergency department in hypovolemic shock. But uh, in iso oncoid liquids, the molecular vibe is very high. It is the same cost as crystalloid liquids, and the absorption is very slow compared to crystalloid liquids. The continuity of the, is, of the safe hydrodissection distance is very long. And here is one of the cases what we use uh, volivan. We give only 20 cc volivan, and the distance between the carotid artery and the nodule is 4.9 millimeters. After five minutes, it is 4.6. After 10 minutes, it is 3.8. And after 20 minutes, it is 2.5. The minimum safe distance is two millimeters. And with Williban, we have no problem. But if we use dextrose in these cases, dextrose resolve uh, mostly in the first five minutes. Before the procedure, uh, we must give the uh, local anesthesia. I never use sedoanesthesia. I uh, use every time local anesthesia in my patient's group. Uh, it is enough. And we give between the strep muscle and the thyroid capsule, uh, pyrolocaine hydrochloride, 10 or 20 uh, ml. And uh, it is enough. It make a perithyroid uh, anesthesia. And here's a uh, example I give between uh, before uh, local anesthesia. And here I go perpendicular with my needle and give between the carotid and the nodule 
dextrose and make here a safe hydro dissection area. Look here again. I push and I give in this case is only 10 cc dextrose and we have here a very safe area. Another patients I give under the strep mask, uh, muscle between the thyroid capsule, local anesthesia. Can I and try again? You see. We, are, uh, we have uh, two reasons to give local anesthesia here. The first is perithyroidal anesthesia. The second is if we give here lo uh, local anesthesia fluid, we separate the strep muscle with the thyroid capsule. This is very important because then we avoid it uh, from adhesions. Maybe the patients have in the future uh, uh, operations and the general surgeons don't uh, like uh, adhesions. Therefore, it is very important before the beginning of operations, give here uh, local anesthesia. And we see here the artery close to the thyroid uh, nodule and I go here with the needle perpendicular. I navigate them, then I push it and I separate the carotid artery from the thyroid nodule with the fluid. And now we have a here safe zone. Here is another patient. Firstly, I give here uh, local anesthesia between the strep and the thyroid capsule. Then I don't change the needle, I only change the back. And then I give in the second step, I navigate the needle and push here dextrose to uh, separate them from uh, the carotid artery from the nodule. Here is another case, uh, a right parathyroid adenoma. It is uh, between eight and 10 millimeter and the parathyroid is very high. As we see here, the right parathyroid adenoma is close to the right uh, carotid artery and it is close to danger zone and as we know here are the regular your nerve course and what we do i go with a needle perpendicular i give dextrose and i separate it from the carotid this is the first step the second step is i navigate my needle under the parathyroid adenoma and i push here 20 cc dextrose and as we see, the parathyroid adenoma go more uh, higher. And the another step is, then I use the lateral approach. I push here more dextrose. And here are the recurrent laryngeal nerve uh, course. And we have a very good uh, hydro section. And we have a very good safe area. And the last step is, I go with the needle and try. And now is the uh, ablation very safe. It is very quick. Only in 10 seconds, we ablated and it is finished. Okay. Moonshot technique. Uh, normally in the literature, every time uh, the, tech, the moonshot technique is established from Korea, from uh, and in him technique, he say always use the trans isthmic approach to avoid thermal injuries in the danger triangle. But sometimes, uh, if you are lefty or uh, if the nodule uh, position is very different, sometimes we can use the lateral approach or cranial caudal. It's dependent on your skills. Always we begin from the posterior inferior corner of the nodule. And if we see the bubbles, we remove the needle back and uh, ablate it again. Why we begin from the posterior inferior part? We have two reasons. The first reason is if we begin from the superior part, the nodules uh, have a shadow and this closes the anatomical leaf. The second part is while we give hydro section, I always begin from the posterior inferior part because we have here a, a safe hydrosection zone. 
And uh, if I do it in the late time, then it's the ZORP and we uh, miss the safe zone. Therefore, we begin from the posterior inferior side and go uh, up. But the nodule is 3D and we do it like slicing the apple. So firstly, the anterior part from, posterior, from uh, inferior to superior, then the middle part from inferior to superior and the posterior part of the superior. We have two techniques. Uh, this first technique is the moving shot technique. The second is the overlapping technique. Uh, in the beginning of the target ablation, I used the overlapping technique. Uh, this technique is normally, we use the thickness in liver uh, ablations. The, the problem in overlapping technique is we go with the needle and fix it. We cannot ablate it the peripheral, peripheral margins. Therefore, the regrowth point is uh, still there and it's regrowth. The second is, if we go too much uh, to the peripheral zone, we can then occur uh, uh, thermal injuries. But in moving shot technique, we go to the peripheral zones and if we see, we see the uh, bubbles, we move back, we always move, therefore, we uh, then uh, thermal injury uh, incidence rate is very low and we ablated all the nodules we cover all the nodules is very important here is my first cases in this cases i use uncooled microwave technology is old technology with overlapping technique what we see here firstly the incomplete ablation this area are incomplete and the second, we see here, here three carbonization channels. This is the technique with uh, overlapping technique. But we must entirely always use moving shaft technique. And here is one of my uh, cases. Is I give, I use the lateral approach. I give under the step muscle the uh, local anesthesia. The second step is I give, I do here hydrosection between the carotid the thyroid nodule. Then again, from the posterior part of uh, the nodule uh, to ablation and go to birth. But here is a very important point. This is the nodule and here is the thyroid capsule. If we have not thyroid parenchyme between the thyroid capsule and the thyroid nodule, we must not give here much energy because if we here give uh, thyroid uh, thyroid uh, parenchyme, then we can give uh, good energy. And then uh, we begin in different approaches. If I see the uh, bubbles, I move back. You see, I give the hydro section. We have here on the regular laryngeal uh, closed. Uh, and here's another patient. Before I give here dextrose and the nervous vagus here is on the three o'clock. But I give always uh, hydro section. It is very safe. And then we begin to ablate it from the posterior inferior side to the uh, superior side. And if we see uh, uh, the bubbles, we always go, go back. We don't stay there. If the antenna stay there, uh, then occur carbonization. We must always moving if we see the bubbles. We wait, give the energy here. And if we see the bubbles, we move back. One millimeter, one millimeter, always slowly. And here's another case. This is a toxic adenoma, hypervascular nodule. Before ablation, is where we, we see here in the color Doppler, but after ablation, we don't see, see anything. And uh, before ablation, the patient's TCH was very depressive, but after only after one week, it is in a normal level. And one minute. Another important thing is uh, uh, tirats post-therapeutic because 
Here is the same nodule. Before the ablation, the nodule is isoechoic and is around 10 cc, and uh, it is a soft nodule. But after ablations, the nodule becomes very hypoechoic without vascularization in color doppler and is a hard in shell wave. If we see this uh, nodule, uh, firstly, we think it is a malign nodule. And most of the clinicians uh, try to make a fine needle aspiration biopsy. But after this is a new term in thyroids, it is TIRATS post therapeutic. And here are some uh, patients from this is from literature before these patients have 85 cc liquid rich nodule. And after ablation, it is 7 million mi. And this is one of my cases. She have a spongiform nodule before ablation, 90 cc. I use microablation. After three months, it uh, go from 90 to 3.5 cc, and the volume reduction rate is 96. The best candidates for uh, thermal ablation are the spongiform group. And here are the second. She comes from Nigeria to my clinic, and her uh, nodule was 156 cc, very big. We use microwave and after four months, it goes to 21 cc and the volume reduction rate was 86. And here are the difference between uh, thyroidectomy and after thyroid ablation only uh, small uh, incision, but here is very brutal. And what is the advantage of the thyroid ablations? The first is, the thyroid gland is protected. The second is the patients do not need lifelong thyroid replacement therapy. It is very important. No incision scars on the skin. Outpatient procedure discharged after two hours. And it is very minimal invasive. Uh, in 90% of the patients, we only use local anesthesia. Only in rare patients, we use sedo analysis. And this is my hometown, Antalya. Thank you for listening. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for the excellent presentation. I think we've, um, our doctors must learn a lot of theoretics about the thyroid ablation. It's um, a lot of information, very informative. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, okay, so okay. Sure. Yeah, OK. I continue. Okay, Donna. Yes, please. Uh, please continue. We have some questions in the uh, comment section. We will get back to it later. Okay. 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 I continue. And now I will uh, share you three uh, cases from the beginning to ending. What we do. And the first case is a twenty, uh, sorry, seventy-two uh, age male, and he have uh, twenty-seven. Uh, 27.8 cc uh, nodule. And uh, the nodule features was liquid rich, semi solid. Sorry. Yes. Uh, and the nodule uh, was liquid rich, it's a semi solid. The nodule have a strong arterial supply. And before uh, we measure the shear wave elastography value, it was 13.7. Uh, it was very really soft uh, nodule. It is a good candidate for ablation. And uh, at the anatomic examination, it was close to nervous valgus. And uh, I use only uh, dextrose 20, uh, between 20 and 40 cc for hydrodissection and prilocaine uh, between 10 and 20 cc for local anesthesia. And here we measure uh, the nodule. It is a liquid rich. And here is very important. This is a sign. Uh, firstly, I see, say it before, I look to the nervous vagus. But the problem is in nervous vagus, it is not, it changed the position of nervous vagus, changes in, uh, in the superior and in the inferior part of the carotid artery. Therefore, we must, we must always elevate the superior 
and the inferior part of the carotid artery. And uh, in this case, we have this, please look. And the superior part is, it, it is on the three o'clock, but in the inferior part, close to the thyroid nodule, it is on the six o'clock. Therefore, this case needs a uh, hydrosection. And as we see, it, it has very strong uh, artery supply. And here is import, another important point. This is the inferior thyroid artery. And from inferior thyroid artery occur uh, this artery supply in these cases. And I measure uh, before the inferior thyroid artery. And then the second step is I measure the uh, intranodal vasculity. And here I measure the uh, shear elastography. It was a very uh, soft nodule. And then I use the lateral approach. I give between the st strep muscle and the thyroid capsule, local anesthesia, and I separate them. So mostly I give 10 or 20 cc only. And the second step is after this, I do the section. Now I go with my needle between the carotid and the nodule. I push dextrose, I navigate them. In these cases, I give 60 cc dextrose. If I can, I try uh, to give below the thyroid nodule. I, I navigate my needle. I go to this corner and I try to give here. Then the second is, uh, is I always aspirate the fluid before uh, ablation. We have two reasons. First is, uh, overcome the fluid to ablating is very difficult. And the second is the thermal conductance of the fluid is very high. You can uh, then maybe occur thermal injury. Therefore, it is very important that you aspirate the fluid before the ablations. And in this case, we ablated, so we aspirate the fluid before. Sometimes it's refilled in hemorrhagic nodules, but we don't stop. Now we measure between the carotid artery and the thyroid nodule, and the distance is very uh, big, uh, 12 uh, millimeters. And then uh, the second step is I measure between the danger triangle and the nodule. It is 5.7 millimeters. Okay, now we can begin to ablate. And I go with my needle, and if I see the bubbles, I go back slowly. And the advantage of microwave ablation is, compared to radiofrequency ablation, in microwave ablation, the energy, the heat goes from uh, the tip of the nodule back, like a flame. But in radiofrequency ablation, the heat goes two millimeter for, forward. And therefore, uh, if you go with microwave ablation, you can go to the uh, margin of the thyroid uh, capsule and the energy go not forward, it goes back and it's very safe to ablate it. You see, uh, firstly, I ablated the posterior part uh, of the uh, Nodule, then I go to the middle and the superior. But sometimes uh, in semi solid nodules, in hemorrhagic nodules, uh, the part of the fluids, in this part, I make the moving shot very slow. I wait there to uh, see the bubbles. And uh, in high vascular uh, nodules, I do the same thing. Sometimes the artery part of the nodules are very resistant and I must stay wait. I all my criteria is see the bubbles. If I see the bubbles, I remove back. Sometimes more faster, sometimes more slower. We see here the refilling of the uh, cyst. It is a hemorrhagic nodule. In this cases, is radiofrequency ablations is very difficult. It's because of the heat sink effect, we cannot ablate it very uh, these cases. But in microwave ablation, the internal structure of the nodule it is not important because we have no heat sink effect. Its works don't uh, according to the tissue impedance.
we go to the margin of the nodules and if we see the bubbles we go back and the second important thing what i say before is here is the thyroid nodule and here is the thyroid capsule and we have we have here thyroid parenchyma we can here make we can give here high energy no problem but if we have not here thyroid parenchyma only the uh, strep muscle then we can destroy here the thyroid capsule it's very important in these cases we can give And uh, in this case, uh, ablation time was uh, 27 cc, uh, 11 minutes only. After 11 minutes, the procedure time was uh, finished. And uh, I think now it is finished. I do only the last part of the superior top. Yeah. Here is the superior part top. I do it and it's finished. It's not good. And after ablation, I look from the superior to posterior that, uh, that we have any uh, ineffective ablation. I, I control uh the distance and as we see we have 7.8 and here is 12 millimeters no problem we have some hemorrhage but it's uh, resolved in one minute and here we see the ablated nodule from the posterior to superior and we ablated all the time uh, all the nodule and the second step is i measure and before uh, it was uh, 28 cc and now it is 10 cc because I aspirate the liquid. And when we look with the color doppler, sorry, I go again. It is very important here. Yeah. And uh, when we look color doppler, we see here no uh, vascularity. And then uh, before ablation, it was. 13 kilopascal, but after ablation, uh, second time uh, to edema, it is now 76 kilopascal, more stiff after ablation. And after uh, one hour uh, before discharging, I control the patient again. And you see at the color doctor, no vascularity. Everything is fine, and we discharge him. After uh, post -ab after ablation, uh, I give every patient 120 milligram metoprednisolone IV push. -in. Why? Firstly, uh, to the anti-inflammatory anti effect, and for edema after ablation, and the patient feel him. And I use in big nodules one gram paracetamol IV infusion for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And in every patient, I use one or two hours ice pack. It is very important. And here is metoprednisolone and paracetamol. And uh, we use it here. So, and medication after discharge, uh, I give every patient amoxicillin clonate one gram PID for five days to avoid any uh, infections. And I give the patients diclofenac sodium for three days, uh, not for painkillers. The, the main goal is to uh, the anti-inflammatory effect. I don't give paracetamol. Paracetamol have, have not anti-inflammatory effect. I give diclofenac sodium for anti-inflammatory effect. And this is the, uh, then the patient's goal. And the follow-up is after 45 days, 90 and after six months. And the second uh, 
case is a young woman, 36. Uh, this was the biggest paratroid adenoma that I ablated. It was a four, three and two centimeters, and the volume of the paratroid adenoma was 10.6 cc, and the paratormon was 96, uh, very high the level, and the calcium was high, uh, and this is very big paratroid adenoma. Before ablations, uh, we must look to the anatomy and in paratroid adenoma is the polar artery very important. We must see the entry of the polar artery. If we don't ablate it, the polar artery, recurrence rate is very high. Therefore, the main uh, goal is to ablate it, the polar artery and then the paratroid adenoma. We see here the polar artery. And here we see the video clip of the size of the cell. It is close to. And uh, the, it was very uh, difficult, the approach. And I approach with, uh, from the lateral approach with the needle between the carotid artery and the jugular vein. I go here to below uh, the uh, paratroid adenoma. And then I push dextrose here, you see. I push here dextrose. And now we have here a paratroid. Then I go inside with my needle. Uh, but in paratroid adenomas, uh, while it's uh, close to the uh, danger triangle and uh, to the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve, I do moving shot more uh, quickly, more faster to avoid thermal injuries. And after ablations, I look to the uh, doctor and we don't see here the polar artery. It is ablated and we see here all the paratroid adenoma. It is totally uh, ablated. And uh, every uh, from every uh, patient in uh, females, I look to the vocal cord, uh, but in a maze, I, we cannot see because the hyoid point is very uh, bony and the ultrasound cannot see, but in females, it is very easy. And I look to the vocal cords that are both, uh, the wounds are very fine and we have no thermal complications. And uh, the patient sent me this and before the pilot hormone was 113, but only after uh, two weeks, it goes to 25. It was a very effective ablation for these patients. Here is another patient. This patient come from uh, Romania to me, uh, 34 uh, years old, 10 minutes. She has uh, left a big nodule, very five, four and three centimeters. The nodule volume was 33 and it was a spongiform nodule. But it was very uh, soft nodule and the symptom score, uh, sorry, the cosmetic score was very high. Uh, you can see from the outside. And in these cases, uh, this, it was uh, semi-solid, spongious, but uh, it had very uh, strong uh, arterial supply. Here you see it. And before uh, I look to with share elastography, it was 10 kilopascal, very soft, a good candidate for thermal ablations. And if we look with the color Doppler, it is, uh, sorry, I go again. And uh, if you look with the color doppler, it is strong. We have strong vascularity. I do local anesthesia, and here I go with my needle to hide the section between the carotid artery and uh, thyroid uh, nodule. I go here, then I push here dextrose.
I give in this case for TCC. Then I go from the posterior inferior side. I use in this case transismic approach. And if we see the bubbles, we go back. But while this case have a very uh, strong arterial supply, I do in this case moving shot more slower. If the patient have uh, cystic portions, in these portions, uh, I don't do moving shot. I wait in the cystic portions if I don't aspirate it and I await it so. If we go to the margins here, see, it's the energy go not forward, it's go backward. It is a very big advantage of microwave ablations. In this case, we don't see thyroid parenchyma between the strep and the uh, and after and here is finished. We ablated all the nodule, and after ablation, I look with the color Doppler, but we don't see any uh, vascularity. And uh, I uh, measure again uh, shear wave, and you see it's more stiffer. After the procedure, I look to the local cords, the movement are fine. After one day, she comes to control, and you see here uh, we have no vascularity, and we ablated completely all the nodules. It is finished with no complications. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you very much.